Hello everyone. This time we are going to be having a biology class on ecological associations. Now, I will be very quick about this class. Uh, it's because of those that are preparing to write an exam, I will be doing this video. Now, this video will be of help to students that are preparing to write in the forthcoming exams. I think you're having your JAM or your WIAC exams. All right. So, what are the basic ecological associations? Now, we are going to focus on the main, which are, one, we have the predation. Predation. Then, we have saprophytism. Saprophytism. And, we have symbiosis. Symbiosis. Under symbiosis, we have parasitism. Commensalism. Mutualism. So these are the three uh, groups of the symbiosis or divisions of symbiosis. So let's start by quickly looking at what predation means. When we say predation, it's simply a predator to prey association. When I say predator to prey association, I'm simply referring to um, a bigger organism that is feeding on another organism. When I say bigger organism, I'm referring to, uh, for those that actually watch uh, Najo White, you ought to know that there are some bigger organisms that uh, lay ambush to wait for their prey, the smaller ones, so that they can prey on them and feed on them. Just for example, you have the lion and then you have the, let's say, leopard. Now, when lion chases leopard and then feeds on the leopard, I can as well call the lion the predator because it's the one that is, that is feeding upon the smaller organism, which is the prey. Or you could be having, let's say, snake and then rat. Of course, when snake feeds on rat, I can say that the rat is the prey. Then why the predator is the snake. So in the nutshell, I can say that the predator is the organism, the animal, that feeds on another animal. So I made mention of animals. What does that simply mean? It means that in predation, you cannot find that in plants. So predation is just basically to animals. All right. So that's for the predation. Then the second is saprophytism. Now, saprophytism is simply an association that involves just a single organism, a, li a single living organism. And that living organism tends to feed on dead, decaying organic matter. Such organism is considered as a saprophyte. So organisms that tend to feed on dead, decaying organic matter, they are considered as saprophytes. Classical examples include the fungi. So the fungi, they tend to feed on what? On uh, dead, decaying organic matter. So if you come across a question, let's say in your forthcoming exam, and then they ask you that what association involves only a single living organism? Of course, it should be what? Saprophytism. Now, the, big, the broader or bigger term for saprophytism is called saprotrophism. Saprotrophism. All right. So that's the broader term or the bigger term for saprophytism. Then the next is symbiosis. When we say symbiosis, I can split into two parts. Now, sim means together. Then bios means life. So it means you are having organisms that are living together. That's what is known as symbiosis. And to what end do they live together? Now, it all depends on these three uh, divisions of symbiosis. All right? Now, considering the first, which is parasitism, I consider this as a plus minus relationship therefore commensalism is a plus zero relationship then that of mutualism is a plus plus relationship now all these signs let me break it down when you say plus it means an organism benefits then when you say minus it means an organism suffers harm or it's affected then if, if you see zero, just know that 
an organism is unaffected. All right. So in this case, for parasitism, you are having the plus minus. Simply means there is two. There are two organisms. One is benefiting while the other is suffering harm. So which benefits is actually the parasite. So I can say that in this uh, parasitism, you are having parasite as well as what host. So it is the host that carries the parasite. So what happens is this, the parasite will benefit at the detriment of the host, meaning in the process, the host suffers harm. All right. So when you consider parasites, there are two divisions of parasites, depending on where you can find the parasite. Now, there are some parasites that live outside the body of their host. They are regarded as ecto, ecto parasites. Why those parasites that live within the body of their host or in the inner part of their host? They are called endoparasites. Endoparasites. So when I say ecto, outside, endo, within. So examples of ectoparasites in terms of animals, we should be talking about the mites, the fleas, the ticks. All right. So all those are ectoparasites. Then what about endoparasites? Endoparasites, you can talk about the worms, parasitic worms, like the um, the flukes, the blood fluke, the liver fluke, the tapeworms, ascaris, roundworms. All right. So those are actually endoparasites. And again, plants. There are some parasitic plants. They fall under the ectoparasites because now uh, a plant cannot be living inside another plant and they are now considered as endo, never. You only have plants that live outside. And those parasitic plants, they are actually uh, classical examples. You have the doda, the doda plant. Then you have the misotos, misotos, the misotos, also known as the loranthos. Loranthos. Then we have the witch weed. The witch weed. Now, witch weed is also known as trigger species. All right. So these are classical examples of parasitic plants. So please never should you mistake uh, parasitic plants for carnivorous plants. Carnivorous plants are different from parasitic plants. All right. So for the plant parasites, they live. On their host on the surface of their host and with the use of something that looks more or less like a siphon they inject it into the into the sap of their host and then they derive nutrients from it all right and that part is known as their mouth part they consider it as ostorium ostorium now the ostorium is actually singular then ostoria ostoria is plural so these are plants parasites and they are ecto parasites all right so that's why you see that when you have a parasite parasite is benefiting at the detriment of the host meaning the host suffers harm that's why i consider it as a plus minus relationship then what about that of commensalism when we say commensalism it means we are having two organisms still these two organisms one is called the commensa, the commensa, while the other is called the host. Now, the host doesn't suffer any harm in the process because the twist about our commensalism is that the commensa is the one that benefits. So while the host does not suffer harm in the process of the commensa benefiting from it. Now, let me give you a case study. Now, you must have heard of a feeding relationship between shark and remora fish now the remora fish is a very small fish that tends to hold fast and cling to what to the shark and then it benefits from the shark by what means now from the food the crumbs of the meal of shark that falls from the meal what happens is this the remora fish feeds from it and not only that the remora fish also derive free transportation because anywhere the shark goes to, the remora fish also moves along with it. All right. Then not only that, it also derives um, shelter in that case, as well as protection. What does that mean? It means 
even other organisms that naturally may have um, fed upon the remora fish, they won't. Why? Because they should be scared of shark. So that's also a uh, remora fish uh, deriving protection from shark. But does the shark derive anything from the remora fish? No. But and again, does the shark get harmed in the process? No. So that is actually commensalism. Then there is still another, which is cattle, cattle and egret, those white birds that move along with cattle whenever cattle are grazing. So what's the relationship all about? The egrets, they move along with the cattle because they want their hunting process to be very, very easy for them. And what does that mean? During grazing by cattle, as they are dusting the grasses, feeding on the grasses, dusting it, some insects may be, you know, flying out of the grasses. And what will happen? The egress will not feed on those insects. Normally, as when the cattle were not there, the hunting would have been very difficult for the egrets. But it makes life to be very easy for the egrets because the cattle tends to what? make the hunting easy. But in the process, does the cattle benefit anything from the egret? No. Does the egret benefit from the cattle? Yes. In the process of the egret benefiting from the cattle, does the cattle uh, get harmed in the process? No. So that's commensalism. Then mind you, there is another relationship between cattle and another kind of bird called the ox pecker. Now this ox pecker is also called tick bird. Never should you mistake the feeding relationship between cattle and ingrate and that of cattle and ox pecker. The reason is because cattle and ox pecker relationship has to do with ox pecker tends to remove uh, tick from the bodies of cattle. And when they feed on this tick, they are actually deriving what? Food from the tick because they are eating, they are feeding on the tick. And they are deriving the food from what source? From the cattle, the cattle's body. So by, as they are deriving the food from the cattle's body, the cattle is in turn also deriving benefits from them. Because remember I said that tick is an example of ectoparasite. So the tick will tend to, uh, to suck on the blood of the cattle. So since the ox pecker, they are there to take off the tick. As they are taking off the tick, they are feeding on the tick. So hence they are getting food. But then what would be the benefit of the cattle? The cattle will tend to derive, um, you know, a good health in the process. Because if the, if the ox pecker are not there to remove this tick, then their health will be depreciating, all right? So it means the cattle benefits as well as the ox pecker. So such a relationship is the plus plus, which is mutualism. So cattle and ox pecker relationship is mutualism, while that of cattle and egret is commensalism. So please take note of that. Then we still have other examples of mutualism. Now we have the one of Rhizobium, <clears throat> rhizobium and root nodules of leguminous plants. Rhizobium and root nodules of leguminous plants. Now rhizobium is simply a nitrogen fixing bacterium. So what happens is this, it helps in the fixation of nitrogen to the root nodules of leguminous plants and by, as it, fix, it fixes the nitrogen, the leguminous plants, they tend to what? They tend to derive that. So that's like an advantage to them. Then what should be the benefit of the rhizobium? That process of rhizobium fix, fixing nitrogen and then to the leguminous plants, the leguminous plants will tend to use, utilize the nitrogen in food production. And when they are done uh, producing food, then Rhizobium will derive food from them. So that's to show that indeed this is mutualistic. Both are benefiting. Then we still have another which is insect pollinators. Insect pollinators and flowers. Insect pollinators and flowers. Now that's also mutualistic in that insects pollinators that tend to, you know, visit flowers to feed on nectars. In the process of them feeding on nectars, they are deriving something from the flowers. 
But in that process, they tend to what? Transfer pollen grains from this flower, from one flower to another. So that transference of pollen grains from a flower to another flower is known as pollination. So it in turn uh, brings about benefits to the flowering plants in that they tend to get pollinated. So both of them, they are also benefiting. All right. Then we still have one other example under mutualism. And that example is we have the gut bacteria and herbivores. The gut bacteria and herbivores. Now, herbivores in the form of what? Ruminant animals. Now, if you consider this, this is also mutualism. In that, the gut bacteria, I'm talking about bacteria that is found in the intestine of herbivores. And what does this, um, what do the bacteria help to do in the herbivores in terms of their gut? It tends to help them to, to digest cellulose that is present in the plants that they feed on. Remember that herbivores, they are plant eaters. So what happens is this, that the gut bacteria will tend to break down the cellulose that is found in the cell wall plant and then aids in their quick digestion process. All right. And in turn, that's a benefit to the herbivores. Then what would not be their own benefit? They derive what? Shelter, free housing in the gut of herbivores. So in this case, you can still say that both of them, they are benefiting. So we have quite a number. We have diverse examples. So long you know that two organisms are benefiting, that's mutualism. Then if one is benefiting and the other is not suffering harm, that's commensalism. Then if one is benefiting and it's at the detriment of the other, then that should be parasitism. All right. So it's my hope that this short video class would be of help to you. Whenever they ask you questions with regards to this, you should be able to tackle it. Thanks for watching and do well to subscribe if you are yet to subscribe. I also invite your friends to this channel so as for them to benefit also. Thanks once again for watching and I wish you guys all the best.